Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, vector fields and vector calculus. And I've had some comments that I think are really helpful from you that it would actually be nice to have some physical examples of vector fields to really wrap your head around why we might be taking volume integrals of them. Uh, so I'm going to start off talking a little bit more about some vector calculus, and then towards the end of the class, I'm going to give you some neat examples in fluid mechanics. Okay. Um, okay. So there's a fact that I want to tell you. This is a very, very important fact, um, and it's used all throughout higher mathematics. So in advanced engineering classes, this is a concept that's going to come up over and over and again. And it's the concept of a directional derivative. Okay, so how many of you have heard of the directional derivative before? Okay. Yeah, so this is a really, really important concept. And it's a really simple, uh, intuitive, geometric concept that relates to the gradient. Okay? So the gradient, grad f, the gradient of a function f, grad f, of a function f, can be used to compute the directional derivative of f in some vector direction. Okay, so. I'll write this out in math in a minute. In some vector direction, v. OK, so the idea here is pretty simple. Let's say I have some function f. Maybe it's a function of uh, x and y, or more generally, it could be a function of lots of variables, whatever. So I have some function f. It's a scalar function. And I can use the gradient of f to compute the directional derivative of f in a certain vector direction v. OK, so if you want to know the derivative of f in the v direction, right? I want to know what is the derivative of this function in this v direction in the xy plane. Then it's given by, um, we call it the derivative of f in the v direction. This is just notation equals um, grad f dot v. So we take the gradient of f, which is a vector of partial derivatives. We dot it in the v direction. And then uh, we have to take and normalize it by the length of v, because v might be long or short. OK, this looks maybe more complicated, looks and sounds more complicated than it is. This is super, super, super simple. Um, for example, if v points, um, let's say if v equals the i direction, OK, then this directional derivative in the i direction is just partial f partial x. It's literally the derivative of f in the x direction. If, uh, if v was equal to the j component, kind of the y direction, then uh, this dvf would be partial f partial y. This is not an equal sign, sorry. It's a colon. So my directional derivative kind of makes physical, intuitive sense that if I plugged in some vector v into this formula, I would get the derivative of my function in that direction v. Uh, maybe we'll just verify it. I mean, you know, grad f is a vector of partial f partial x, partial x partial, partial f partial y. And so if I dot that into a vector just in the i direction, it's just partial f partial x. If I dot it with a vector v that's just in the y direction, it's just partial f partial y. 
And if I dot it in some arbitrary v direction, then it's going to be this formula here is the directional derivative. Okay? Super useful concept, super simple. Um, but this gradient really is allowing us to look at the, the directional derivative of, of some function. Okay? Um, this idea will become really, really important when you want to start thinking about uh, so we've been talking about dynamical systems and differential equations in flat Euclidean spaces, you know, x, y, z, or x1, x2, x3. But if you want to start thinking about differential equations on curved surfaces, like on the surface of the Earth, let's say you're uh, trying to make an intercontinental ballistic missile that's, you know, going to go from one point to the other. Maybe it goes this way, maybe it goes this way. Um, then you really are going to be caring about what is the directional derivative of my object, you know, maybe on the surface of the Earth or, um, you know, in these non-Euclidean coordinates. So this directional derivative allows us to do calculus on curved surfaces locally. Okay, that's not something we're going to talk about in this class. That's kind of an advanced, advanced math concept. Okay. Um, Good, so now that we have the directional derivative, I want to go back and talk a little bit more about the uh, continuity equation that we derived. So uh, last lecture, we derived this equation for mass continuity in a volume. So if I had some volume in physical space, maybe like in this room there's air currents, right? I'm talking and I'm creating lots of wind. And if you carved out some volume, then you could create uh, an integral over that volume and calculate how much mass is coming in, how much mass is going out, uh, and things like that. And so the continuity equation that we had from last time uh, was the time derivative of rho. I think really this is a partial derivative. Um, plus the divergence of rho v equals zero. This is just a statement of the law of conservation of mass. And notice last time I messed up and I put the row outside of the divergence, but uh, someone corrected me and this is absolutely the right way to do it. Uh, so I want to look at this expression here a little bit more. This is a little bit funny, right? We're taking the divergence of a scalar function times a vector function, right? V is my velocity field, rho is my density, and I'm taking the divergence of this weird scalar times vector quantity, okay? So let's actually expand this term out and see what it looks like. So if I have div of rho v, well, rho v is essentially, this is div of rho v1 times rho v2 times rho v3, right? My, my three velocity components, v in the x direction, y direction, and z direction, okay? And so if I take the divergence of this, then I'm taking the partial of the first term with respect to x plus the partial of the second term with respect to y plus the partial of the third term with respect to z. Okay, and partial rho v1, this is a scalar function now, with respect to x is equal to rho x v1 plus rho v1 x. Subscript x means I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to x. Okay, so this is just the chain rule. Uh, partial derivative of a times b is partial a b plus b partial a. Okay, so this is my, you know, partial partial x term plus rho sub y v2 plus rho v2 y. That's my partial partial y term plus rho partial in the z direction times v3 plus rho v3 partial derivative in the z direction. Okay, does this make sense what I did here? I just took my, my function rho times v and I wrote it as a vector function, so each component is a scalar function. And I can take the partial derivative of each of these with respect to x, y, and z and add them up. That's the divergence. Uh, any questions at this point? It's okay? Okay. And so now I'm going to pull apart each of these terms. So all of the terms that just have a row with no derivatives in row, I'm going to pull those to one side. So I get row times, um, 
v1x is you know partial v1 partial x plus partial v2 partial y plus partial v3 partial z. And then I'm going to collect all of the terms that have a partial derivative of rho. So rho x, rho y, rho z terms. So plus you know, rho x v1 plus rho y v2 plus rho z v3. OK, what is this quantity here inside this uh, first parentheses? So like inside here, partial v1, partial x, par plus partial v2, partial y, plus partial v3, partial z. What is that? Divergence of v, right? So this is rho times the divergence of v. And what's this, uh, what's this term here? Yeah, del rho dot v. Yeah, exactly. Plus grad rho dotted in the v direction. OK, right, if I took grad rho, I'd get a vector of partial rho, partial x, partial rho, partial y, partial rho, partial z. And if I dotted it with v, then I would get this sum here. So this, essentially, you can take the chain rule of divergences. OK, there's kind of this, this vector identity. This is. This is just the chain rule of divergence of a scalar function times a vector function. It's equal to rho divergence of v plus grad rho dot v. And remember, this is the directional derivative that we just wrote down. This term here is the derivative in the v direction of rho times, times the length of v. But it's, it's essentially just the derivative in, of my density in the, in the v direction. That's what this term means physically. I have a density function. I'm taking the derivative in the direction of the vector field. OK? OK, good. Uh, so we're getting somewhere now. So now we have our uh, continuity equation. And this funny divergence of rho v term, we actually now can break it up into simpler terms that make a little more physical sense. And this is what we end up doing in most um, advanced physical systems in elastic equations and quantum mechanics in fluid mechanics, is we take our constitutive relationships, our partial differential equations that represent some conservation law, and we start thinking, like, what do each of these terms physically mean? Is one of these terms a mass production term? Is one of these terms a you know, divergence of my velocity field term? And so we can actually start writing, uh, writing these things down in a way that actually makes sense. So this is plus rho times the divergence of v plus grad rho dotted in the v direction. This always has to equal 0 for any system where mass is conserved. OK, so unless you have a gas and you're actually beaming in a laser so that you're changing the um, OK, what's a good example? Um, there are actually some fluid systems where you can have to use special relativity. Um, unless you have any creation or destruction of mass, this is true. OK? So this is true for all fluids that we'll mostly ever be working with, unless you deal with. Um, so it turns out that the lasers that they use for uh, like the airborne laser are huge chemical chemical lasers. They essentially um, have a big tube, and you have uh, something like hydrogen gas coming in on one side, and maybe fluorine gas. Is it F or just FL? Let's call it F. I'm not a chemist. Fluorine gas coming in on the other side. And these things react extremely violently, and they start having resonant uh, shock waves, and they create tremendous amounts of energy. And then you actually need energy equations, and there is different types of mass that are being created. Um, if you wanted to look at the fluid dynamics after a nuclear bomb explosion, 
this wouldn't be strictly speaking true. You'd need an energy equation, and you'd also need equations for the different chemical species that are being created. But this is true for all gases and fluids that we're normally going to come in contact with. OK, so if, if rho is constant everywhere, So what are some examples of fluids where my density is basically constant everywhere? Is the air a good example of a fluid where my density is constant everywhere? At low speeds locally in this room, yes. In, you know, around the wing of an airplane, no. All right, because it's compressible at high speeds. A good example is like liquid water. Okay, so the water in my coffee cup is basically incompressible. You would be hard pressed to change rho at all. Okay, you have to try really, really hard to change rho in my coffee cup. Uh, you could do it by heating it up, but assume temperature is constant. So if rho is constant everywhere, then this partial rho partial t is equal to zero. That just means my density doesn't change in time. That's fine, right? Density doesn't change in time. And we have that the gradient of rho is also 0. It's a 0 vector. There's no partial of rho with respect to any direction. Another way to say it is that the derivative of rho in, the, in v direction is equal to 0 for all directions v. OK? This, this density doesn't have any variance in any direction. It's uniform. And so if my rho is constant everywhere, then I just killed two of my terms. I've killed this term, and I've killed this term. And so the only equation that I have left is that rho divergence of v equals 0. OK? And you can say that's the equivalent to just the divergence of v is equal to 0. So for fluids where my density is completely constant, this has to be true. This is a statement of conservation of mass for a uniform density fluid. Notice that this means that the divergence of my vector field has to be 0. And what did we call flow fields that have 0 divergence? Incompressible. Right? So we call this incompressible. because it means volumes are neither growing nor shrinking with this vector field. And now we see that this word incompressible has a very, very physical meaning. It is the condition that of, that of conservation of mass in an incompressible fluid. In a fluid where my density can't change, that means it's incompressible. I can't change the density. Okay. So there's kind of this nice mathematical meaning behind this divergence equal to 0. If I have a fluid where the density can't change, then my velocity field has to be divergence free. Or else I would not have conservation of mass. That's the only way I can have conservation of mass. OK, any questions about kind of what we've, what we've done in this, this example? OK, so this is an example of engineering approximation. So more and more in the rest of this class, and then in 565, I'm going to be teaching you more about um, how do we make good engineering approximations to simplify our system. So this equation is much, much simpler than this equation. OK, so if I can get away with assuming that my density is basically constant, I'm going to. And I'm going to use this equation, because it's much simpler. Okay, this would be easier to program on a computer. It would be easier to do analytic analysis you know, on this equation than on this equation when density is varying. So for example, if I have a low speed airplane where the Mach number is really, really small, maybe less than 0.1, so I'm going less than 0.1 times the speed of sound, then I'm going to make the assumption that my flow is incompressible, even though it's not exactly true. Okay, because I benefit from having this approximation. I got a simplification. Okay, um, good. 
Any questions about like how we've used partial derivatives or vector derivatives or divergence? Okay. This general concept of deriving a differential equation, a partial differential equation from a volume integral is ubiquitous. It's, it's how we derive partial differential equations in almost all physical systems. Um, and then analyzing the vector terms is how we get physical interpretation about the system. Okay? So you could write down a similar equation for turbulent fluctuations, and each of the terms has physical meaning in terms of energy production or dissipation or you know, convection of large-scale structures. And there's similar meanings for all of the terms in Schrodinger's equation, uh, the elastic beam equation, pretty much any partial differential equation. These come from physical conservation laws. OK, okay good. Um, so I'm almost done with math, and then I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, OK, um, so there's two things I want to talk about. We've introduced this concept of a vector field V, OK? And I told you that you can do things with this vector field just like we could in ordinary differential equations. So, so some properties of V. Um, so V is often the solution of a partial differential equation. And this will be the entire topic of the next quarter, is essentially how to find this vector field if you know some partial differential equation. OK, so one example would be the Navier-Stokes equations. So if I have the Navier-Stokes equations, which are just some big PDE, slightly more complicated than my continuity equation, including my continuity equation, then the solution of that differential equation is a vector field. So vector fields can be the solutions of differential equations. That's kind of one fact. Another fact is that I can take this vector field and I can use it as a differential equation. I can say that I have some x dot equals v times x. Sorry, let's say v of x. That makes a little more sense, right? This vector field is a function of space. And these two, it took me a really long time to really get to the bottom of how these two properties are related, OK? But the best example, I'm going to keep drawing the same picture over and over, because it's the only part of the world I can draw. This is Florida and Texas. The idea is. This V is the solution of some partial differential equation, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. Energy. If I write down those three conservation laws, which are you know, mass is conserved, um, force equals mass times acceleration, and energy is conserved, those are my three basic conservation laws in most systems, then I get some vector field V in space. Okay, V is a vector field that is a solution of some Navier-Stokes equation, some differential equation. And it gives me a direction where the fluid points at every point in space. So that's this first interpretation of a vector field. Now, the second interpretation of a, of a vector field is it tells me how things would move if I dropped them in that fluid. Okay, if I dropped a lifeboat in this fluid, this vector field tells me how that vector, how that lifeboat is going to move. And I could literally take some initial condition x naught, and I could integrate it through that vector field, and I would get the trajectory of my buoy or my lifeboat. Probably this vector field also changes with respect to time. Remember, our differential equations could also change with respect to time. They could have external forcing. 
that cause them, you know, this velocity field changes with a daily cycle due to the sun and the wind. Uh, and so the solution of this would look like x at time t is equal to my initial position x naught plus the integral from 0 to t of my vector field of x of tau at time tau d tau. Sorry, the red's a little hard to see. But this is the basic idea of what we mean by a vector field. A vector field is a field of vectors that describes some quantity. Like this is literally the fluid velocity vector at every point in the Gulf of Mexico. And I can use that vector field to do things like integrate particles into that vector field. I can see where oil would go if I dropped oil or where a lifeboat would go if I dropped a lifeboat. And it's just like what we learned in the first half of this class with ordinary differential equations. This is just some nonlinear, you can just call this, this is f of x and t. It's the same thing. It's the same vector f that we've been talking about before, except now this f is a solution of a partial differential equation. Okay? And it's funny, because the partial differential equation, we define this partial differential equation by writing down integrals of v that have to be true. Right? We wrote down an integral for the density having to be, you know, the mass had to be conserved. So I could write down a volume integral for conservation of mass, and I got a condition on v that has to be true. Namely, that my divergence has to be zero if rho is constant. That's one condition on my vector field. I could also write down a volume integral that my momentum has to be conserved over a volume. And I would get another constraint equation, a partial differential equation constraint on V called the Navier-Stokes equations. If I was heating up my system, then I would have to write down an energy equation that my energy, you know, whatever flux of energy I have into my system, you know, plus the energy total in the system has to be conserved. And I would get a third energy equation. So we get these partial differential equations based on volume integrals of V. And then those constraints define what the vector field has to be to satisfy those constraints of mass, uh, momentum, and energy conservation. And so this really, I think, in my mind, motivates why I'm interested in things like triple integral of V with respect to some volume and you know, how this might relate to a surface integral and things like that. So this is really motivating Gauss's theorem because Gauss's theorem allows me to take these conservation equations and get partial differential equations like we saw for continuity. We're going to talk a lot more about um, topic one next quarter, but what we're going to do for the rest of the quarter is essentially establish the mathematical framework for how do we write down these volume integrals? How do we deal with vector valued functions v? You know, how do we write equations in terms of operators like divergence and gradient and curl in a sensible way? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about um, more on Friday and on Monday and uh, Wednesday and Friday of the, the week after Thanksgiving. Um, Okay, good. So let's talk, well, first of all, are there questions uh, before I go to like a keynote or pre PowerPoint presentation? There probably should be. I mean, this takes a long time to, actually, it took me a long time for this to make sense. So when people talk about like solving PDEs, talking about, I don't know, both steps, but yeah, like, cause, right, to get a specific solution, you have to do one and two, right? Well, but, so usually solving the PDE is just one. Solving, so V, my vector field is usually the solution of my partial differential equation. Okay, like, if I want to know what is the flow field over a wing, I would solve a partial differential equation and I would get a vector field. But then if I want to know what would happen if I put smoke in the air and I wanted to know like where is the smoke going to go, that would be problem too. So solving for the vector field in the Gulf of Mexico, that's solving a partial differential equation. 
And then if I want to use that solution to figure out where contaminants are going to go, that would be part two. Okay? And part one is huge, right? This has been, actually both of these are huge. These are two of the largest fields of mathematics, right? The largest and most successful fields of mathematics. And one of the third most successful fields is vector calculus, just getting the language and the scaffolding so that you can think about these problems in a reasonable way, okay? Um, and problem one can be broken down into two parts. One is writing down the partial differential equation based on physics. And part, you know, the other part of this is solving that partial differential equation. So here, we wrote down the partial differential equation based on physics. But I haven't told you at all how to solve this. Right? That's actually hard. <laughs> so writing down the equations is usually much simpler than actually solving them. Like, we don't have a closed form solution to Navier-Stokes. 150 years later, we still don't have a solution, and we probably never will. We definitely will, never will have a closed-form solution because it's chaotic. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to show you some examples just to kind of get this idea a little bit more concrete. And these are some slides. I think some of these slides I've already shown you before, but we have a lot more context to understand them now. Okay, so we're going to be talking about applications of vector fields. Um, this is just a cool fluid flow field that I like a lot because um, it looks eerie. Okay, so examples of fluid vector fields. V arrow is a vector field, right? The flow field of the air that an airplane flies through defines a vector field, right? There is a vector direction for where the wind is pointing at every point in space in the atmosphere. Okay, so I have an atmospheric vector field V. And you can get cool patterns, like this is the flow past a uh, mountaintop. And you see you get this Karman vortex shedding from a mountain, which is kind of amazing. Um, other examples, if you have wind flowing past a mountain ridge, you'll get this huge, uh, what's called a wind rotor, so a big kind of sideways tornado-looking vortex rolling in, up off of this mountain. And these have been known to actually flip small to medium-sized passenger planes outside of Boulder. So this happened a number of years ago, and so this is a very well-studied vector field, is the vector field of a flow past a mountain. Again, these are solutions to partial differential equations. But I'm curious, what happens when I put an airplane into that vector field? Okay, that's more of the x dot equals v of x. Uh, the flow field created by engineering devices like an airplane, this is a vector field feature that is derived from our engineering solutions. Um, so you can see that this flow is being pushed downward. These vortices are pushing down. And that's a direct um, indication that my airplane is getting lift by conservation of momentum. Right? Conservation of momentum means that if I'm pushing air down, then the air is pushing me up. Okay? So this picture you know, essentially encapsulates what we're doing in the Navier-Stokes equation. We're writing down that, that momentum has to be conserved. And this vector field is the outfall of that conservation law. That's the solution of the PDE, is how this air points in these directions. And you can see that the cloud is being pulled into these vortex cores, so these cloud particles are being pulled through this vector field. Um, microburst wind shear, uh, super dangerous phenomenon. It happens a lot in the south and southeast in the summer, and it downs airplanes. You can read about it. It's super cool. Um, OK, so there's other important examples of fluids, right? Like beer bubbles. Uh, so if you have a glass of beer, you'll find that bubbles rise from the bottom to the top, right? Now, if you just computed the density of the beer to the density of the bubble, you would find that they have a density ratio of about 500 to 1, okay? Which would suggest that the beer bubble should rise at about 500 gravity, acceleration of about 500 times the acceleration of gravity. 
but we know that's not true. These bubbles aren't going you know, incredibly fast upward. They're just kind of rising upward. And the reason is because as the bubble moves through the fluid, it creates a vector field. You can see this vector field of the bubble moving the fluid out of the way. And because it has to move the beer out of the way, that kind of puts drag on its motion. Okay, so this beer has a vector field that's induced by the buoyant motion of these bubbles. And the bubbles moving through the beer satisfy some differential equation. Okay, I, uh, I think we should all try this experiment. Um, again, you know, airplanes. And so this idea here that I can take conservation laws, I can take conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid, I can take conservation of momentum, forget this integral term, just the first part of this is conservation of momentum. And I can write down partial differential equations for what my velocity field u has to be to satisfy those conservation laws that we know are fundamentally true for all classical mechanical systems. And you get these great, um, you know, very rich, complicated flow fields. Um, there is a vector at every point in space telling me where smoke visualizations would go. So this is essentially a smoke visualization where I've injected some artificial kind of simulated smoke, and it follows places in the vector field. And this is uh, that example of the Gulf of Mexico. So this is Louisiana here, Florida, um, Houston, somewhere around here. And you can see that the velocity field for what the Gulf of Mexico currents are doing allows me to follow where oil particles would go. They're getting stretched along these directions in this vector field. Okay? Okay, so let's think about this example. I told you that we can have a vector field V or U. This is the solution to some differential equation, some PDE, some conservation laws. And then I can have some particle in that vector field, right? I drop a flotation device in the Gulf of Mexico. That's X. V is the velocity field of the Gulf of Mexico. X is a buoy. I drop it in. Okay. And we can essentially follow that particle for every point tau between t time 0 and time t. And it experiences a different region of that velocity field because it's moving in space. So it sees a different velocity every time it moves in space. But I can follow it around and find out where it is at some later time. I can integrate this vector field. This is all that we did in the first half of the class is integrate vector fields. Okay, that's why I called my differential equations vector fields, because they're vector fields. Okay, and I can take some initial grid of particles. Some, I can drop some big rectangle of test particles in a simulation. If I know what the velocity field is in the Gulf of Mexico, maybe I have satellite measurements or I have a model or something. I know what the velocity field measurements are. Then I can drop some particles and I can integrate them forward in time, and I can see where they go. I can see where they stretch out to. OK? This actually is flow past an airfoil. This is not the Gulf of Mexico, but you could do the same thing for the Gulf of Mexico. And the idea is that for every single red dot, I could take that dot, and I could look at what its neighbors are doing. OK, so I drop a point. And I could imagine dropping test points you know, in plus and minus x directions and plus and minus y directions. So this is a buoy, and these are four more test buoys. You can think of it like that. And I can see where all of them go. And if the flow is compressible, sorry, incompressible, if the flow has no divergence, then this volume has to equal this volume. Even though some directions are stretching and some directions are contracting, the volume of fluid isn't changing. Okay, so this is kind of a statement of divergence free if this volume stays the same. And so what I want to do is look for regions of really, really high degrees of stretching in my flow. I want to know at some points here, my flow is really stretching particles apart a lot. 
Okay, and I want to know that because that's where oil is going to be spread the most. I want to know where things disperse the most in my vector field. And so what you can do is you can drop these grids of particles. You can integrate them forward and backward in time, and you can see where they go and where they came from. And you can find these regions, these red and green regions, where the fluid particles, where if I dropped smoke or buoys in the flow, where they separate the most in time. Okay, So in this flow past an airfoil, some particles just whiz by and go really, really fast. And some particles get trapped into this wake region and go really, really slow. And so they're separating a lot. And the boundary between those points is lighted up in red. Okay, This is just one example of what you can do if you have a vector field and you start integrating particles or states through that vector field. Okay, So to get the velocity field for the flow past an airfoil, I had to solve a partial differential equation. I haven't told you how to do that yet. We'll do that in the next quarter. But to solve the positions of these white dots in time, we use ordinary differential equations. Right? That's just x dot equals my vector field of x. We know how to do that from the first part of this class. And these red and green curves are kind of these time-varying analogs of the structures that we drew in phase portraits earlier. So this is a time-varying phase portrait of what's happening in my flow. Uh, other examples of vector fields, right? every single one of the large objects in the solar system is creating a gravitational potential field, which is thus creating a vector field. So near Jupiter, things are being pulled into Jupiter. Near Jupiter's moons, things are being pulled into Jupiter's moons, and so on and so forth. So you get this vector field, some v as a function of x and time, for the entire solar system. Okay, so solving for that vector field is a huge pain. We can't do it analytically. We have to do it computationally. But once I know that vector field, once I know v as a function of space and time, then I can imagine what would happen if I dropped a satellite or an asteroid. And then I could follow that asteroid or satellite around this vector field using ordinary differential equations like we've done before. OK, we could also generalize this to systems that are not physical. Like if you wanted to think about polio spread through Africa, you could say that there is a vector field defined by the gradient of the polio concentration. So I have some scalar function of how much polio is in Africa. This is uh, actually Nigeria. And I could define a vector field that is given by the gradient of that scalar field. So there's a big gradient from here to neighboring cities, right? Like these two cities are polio hotspots. And their neighboring cities are not polio hotspots. So it might stand a reason that polio is spreading out from these cities, kind of like heat. And you could write down the gradient of this scalar function. And you would find that the gradient points away from the hot spots into the cold spots. And so polio is being driven from these population centers out. That's a vector field you could derive from this scalar field if you wanted to model how polio is spreading in Africa. OK, Okay. those are just a few examples um, of this, this really, really important idea. OK, so there are extremely important vector fields that we want to study. Those vector fields come up all over the place in physical systems, in, you know, if you follow packets in the internet, that defines a vector field from computer to computer. So vector fields are everywhere. They're often the solution of conservation laws, of physics equations that we know, like conservation of mass and momentum and energy. And oftentimes, we can use them to see how things move in that vector field. Okay, So vector fields fundamentally mean that things are moving. Things are flowing 
from one point to another. OK, so for the rest of the class, we're going to be talking about what is the language of how we talk about vector fields, and what is the language that we can use to write down, to translate our physics intuition of conservation laws into partial differential equations so that we can find solutions to these vector fields. OK? So I want to give some motivation, because this can get a little bit dry when we're just doing div and grad and curl of v. But v is super important. And div and grad and curl are the language of how we operate with these vector fields. OK? Um, that's all I have for today. I'll see you all on Friday. <laughs>